Hello and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Welcome back once again to our coverage of this year's Academy Awards. Just like last year, we have compiled interviews from the nominees in the Best Cinematography category, conveniently edited into one episode, just to make it a little bit easier for you to fill out your Oscars ballot, whether you are an Academy member or you're just trying to win your at-home Oscars pool. So the nominated films this year in the cinematography category are Dune, directed by Denis Villeneuve with cinematography by Greg Fraser. Nightmare Alley, directed by Guillermo del Toro with cinematography by Dan Lautzen. The Power of the Dog, directed by Jane Campion with cinematography by Ari Wegner. The Tragedy of Macbeth, directed by Joel Cohen with cinematography by Bruno Delbanel. And finally, West Side Story, directed by Steven Spielberg with cinematography by Janusz Kaminski. Due to the uh, very busy schedule of these amazing cinematographers, we were not able to interview everyone in time for our posting deadline, but I'm super pleased to say that we have most of the nominees this year joining us in conversation. And each of these exclusive interviews is available only here on the Dolby Institute podcast. For these conversations on cinematography, I'm joined by my colleague, Stuart Bowling, who is the content and creative relations director for Dolby. This is another big episode, so let's jump right in. First up in alphabetical order is Dune, and here's my conversation with director of photography, Greg Fraser. Greg, uh, thanks for joining us today to, uh, to talk about Dune and your incredibly well-deserved Academy Award nomination for the film. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Can you talk to us a little bit about what were your first initial conversations with Denis about the film and how he wanted it to look and, and, uh, and, and how you guys developed that together? Well, the, f the funny thing with Denis is the, the first conversations we had weren't actually about how it looked. That was really what was exciting about our conversations. I just let him uh, speak about how he felt about this particular film. And I don't know if you've ever heard him speak about this, but he's like a, like a kid, like a teenager. He's so excited by this, by the IP, so excited by the worlds, by the characters. So um, I just let him talk for a couple of meetings, actually. And, you know, in those conversations, it was very clear how exactly he wanted the, the film to feel. And so from that point, we then started developing the, the, the look of Arrakis. You know, like he was quite, I think he'd been, he'd scouted some, um, some Middle Eastern deserts and, one thing he, he noticed and said to me was he loved the fact that there was hazy white skies in a lot of these places. And he'd love Arrakis not to have that classic yellow sand, blue sky look, you know. Um, so he wanted white sky. And so we, we endeavoured where possible to, to keep the skies white um, through either exposure, through lack of polarisation, if that was the thing. Yeah, so it was kind of a... Um, uh, a, a, that was the, the, the main thing we talked about. And then from there, we started getting into the particulars about how we would sort of try and shoot. We were shooting on film versus digital. We were shooting on Alexa 65, Alexa LF, IMAX. Like then we just, we, we did a, a massive uh, camera test with pretty much all the cameras and went out to the desert just south of uh, Los Angeles and, and yeah, shot some, shot, shot some good tests. So Dune is a, like, a true cinema epic. You've got like massive sets, expansive desert, big spaceships, the usual. Um, so how do you approach photography and lighting, knowing that visual effects, you're going to have to deal with set extensions, et cetera, that will come later in the process? Well, I try not to change my technique too much, to be frank with you. Like it's, it, it, it may sound a little bit kind of silly, but the, the, I, I approach this as small as I could and you know, uh, obviously that sounds ridiculous when you're looking at the, a sandworm that's the size of, you know, 50 football fields. But but I tried to approach it as small as I could. And, like, I tried to minimise the lighting if I could. Now, obviously there are some sets in this film that, my, you know, if my gaffer heard me say I tried to minimise the lighting, he would literally spit his coffee out because it's, it was ridiculously large. But the, the, the intent was that. The intent was... If you walked under that set, you were blindfolded, you got thrown in the back of a van, you got pulled out on that set that you wouldn't know that there was all that infrastructure behind the walls, that it felt natural, it felt single sourcey, it felt like it was coming from one place. In our conversations with Denis, we know that he's a, he's a, he's a very rigorous planner 
And that storyboarding was a huge part of the the process for him and sort of thinking about, uh, about how the, um, you know, the action would all lay out as a cinematographer. How do you balance sort of that rigorous planning? And obviously it's a massive film on such a big scale. You have to have things thought out well ahead of time, but you also need to, you need to be able to pivot and respond to things on the day and respond to the actors. And how do you strike that balance? Well, you're right. He is a fantastic planner and it's really exciting because it gives everybody information. It gives everybody information about what's required, you know, um, what, not necessarily so what's required, but also what he's thinking. Um, because you're right on the day that can get thrown away. If, if things are better, if the actors come with something better, if, if the, the, the gods of cinema are in our favor and it's blowing the wind from the other direction and we're better off shooting in that direction. Well, we will, but it starts with a plan and it allows everybody to at least get into his mind to begin with. So that's the main reason I feel that storyboards and previews are important. Um, if you look at some of the previews we did, it's pretty close, particularly some of the, the CG previews. You know, if we're flying in an ornithopter or if we're watching an ornithopter dive, like some of those shots were very much kind of planned. Uh, and it just allowed us to, again, know what was in his mind, but also make uh, provisions for that. You know, shooting in the desert uh, can be challenging. Uh, did you enjoy shooting the, the daytime desert scenes, nowhere to hide? I loved it. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, you put, put me in my element there. Me and my crew, I will say, I've got the, 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 the best bunch of, um, of desert rats, uh, in, in the world. We, we loved it. I think that, you know, I think when we all got the call to, to do part two, we all went like, yes, let's get back out into the desert. There's something very magical out there. You know, there's something very magical in, in the, in the sand. It sounds insane and, when someone looks at the pictures and goes, there's nothing there. There's actually a lot there. There's a, there's a spirit in the desert. There's a, there's a something in the air. I don't know. It's not spice, but there's something. You know, obviously there's a ton of action in Dune, but one of the things I wanted to ask you about was your approach to uh, composition and movement of the camera and movement in the frame, because it, it often feels like very sort of like documentary like or voyeuristic, like we're like, it's not frenetic camera work at all. We seem to be kind of observing and hanging back and seeing this, all this happen in front of us. Can you talk about your approach to sort of composition? And, and obviously Denis is a huge part of that, but uh, specifically in this film, it was very striking to me. It, it was quite a thing where we, we, we did go close and then wide. It, we didn't often do mid shots, actually. Um, I mean, we did, but there are times where it was more important to kind of be like there and then boom, wide. You know, it's just you kind of see the person and you see their environment. And how wide you go is often how much you create the scale of a, of a, of a film. And you know, and, and as Denis has said in the past, and he verbalized it quite well, actually, and I was, we all work on, on instinct as opposed to, you know, verbally, but he said, sometimes these things are so big, you don't even, can't even get them in the freight. That's how you know they're really big. So, you know, like you go from a person to a wide shot that you can't get them in the frame, and then you go to an even wider shot where they are in frame, but what you saw first, what you thought was massive now is small, medium sized. Does that make sense? Like you, you kind of just show big, bigger, biggest. So there's a very uh, organic feel to the movie. Uh, and you chose to use a lot of natural light sources, which feels a little bit unusual for a uh, sci-fi space opera. What motivated that? Well, I think that's that was just that was Denis' plan. I think he, he, he said in the past that he loves my use of natural light, which is very, um, very lovely to hear because. You know, I do love use of natural light. I know that you can't always shoot with natural light because it's, it's not always practical. But I do love things to feel like they're coming from the real world, you know, and, and not necessarily um, artificial, but coming from motivated by the sun or the moon or the reflection off the wall or the this or the that. So um, it, was, it seemed like a natural thing. It was particularly uh, a desire for Denis to do that. He didn't want to look electronic because it's not the world. There's other sci-fi films that look like that, like electronic light. This is not that. This is the opposite of that. Greg, you brought up the uh, the ornithopter sequence previously, uh, which I th thought was just a, a that that you know crash in the desert, which I thought was just a, amazing. Um, you know, I, I think that a, a more typical way to approach that would have been to shoot it on green screen and then have to deal with all of all of those issues. But I know that you took a very different approach. 
uh, to that particular sequence. Can you talk about it? And, and I think it also brings up, you know, what you were just talking about, about using natural light as well, of course. One, one fantastic ally that we had on this was um, Paul, who was a VFX supervisor. And he knows that if you start from a place that doesn't look real, and he knows how that happens through lighting that doesn't look real, that you end up ha having a real problem in post. So he was a strong advocate with me to to do things as naturally as possible. So in my mind, when I'm we're sitting in a meeting and somebody says, right, okay, we're talking about interior ornithopter flying over uh, Arrakis. How do we do it? Do we do it on stage? No, because it's natural light. It's daytime, natural light. Do we do it on the back lot? Well, think about this for a second. The back lot has a lot of, uh, you know, outside the windows, there's stages, there's tents, there's all these things. So how do we block those? Well, we have to block them with green screen. So if you put a, a row of green screen around an ornithopter, instantly the light's affected because if you're 5,000 feet above a desert, the light's coming from the sky, the sun, and the bounce from the sand. So you've got to create those elements to to give it the base of the light quality. So we we decided with the help of production that we were going to find a location high on a hill. We found, I think, an old um, an old bunker that was was overgrown, but it was high on top of overlooking Budapest. And what it meant was that the horizon line was lower than where it would have been if we were at ground level. So we put it up on a uh, we put it on a base, a motion base, on this hill, and then around the bottom of it we had a um, like a dog, like a, like a, like a, you know, the collars that dogs wear when they when they've had an operation, like a, like a collar that bounced yellow light. So the same color as the sand. So effectively, if you blowed your eyes, you're in the ornithopter, you couldn't see any green from the, the, the hills. And for the most part, you couldn't see the unit because they were hidden behind the, behind the, the base. So that to be pure from a lighting perspective, that was the approach. Obviously, you have to take some, some little cuts here and there and it wasn't quite the horizon wasn't quite the right level but it was so close that you would have a hard time uh distinguishing it you bring up a, a an interesting point about post um if i have this correct so you shot this on the aria lexer lf mainly yes. uh, but then you did a transfer to 35 and then digitized back for the final look of the film correct um can you talk through the the reasoning for doing that why yeah, a few people have said that. They've said, why? <laughs> because, and, and it's a really good question because, and, and it goes back to um, the reasoning why some people like film and why some people like digital. You know, again, if you talk to different people have different opinions about um, what, like, why to shoot digital? Well, because it, it's, film has all these problems. What's the problems? Grain, it's weaves, it has stretches, it has noise, like, that's the problems. Digital doesn't have any of those problems. Problems, whereas some people could argue actually that the problems that it gets rid of actually gets rid of a lot of the the emotion or the the something about film that has more warmth, more humanity to it than digital. So I, I agree with both. Both, by the way, like I, I, I'm quite agnostic when it comes to these things, but I do believe that sometimes our quest for perfection as an industry means that we're we're lacking something that we've lost something along the way so you, you need to basically give ourselves back a little bit of that imperfection and what's great about digital cameras is that they're very precise and you know exactly what you're getting and the exposure is what it is and short of a data corruption you can sleep well at night knowing that you've got it but being able to put back to film is kind of gives you the best of both worlds. So I don't, it's a new tech, it's a new thing. It's a new technique. I wouldn't say I'll do it on every movie, but so far I've been super impressed with the way it looks. And I'm really happy to have that extra, I don't know, extra sort of weapon on my belt, you know, to be able to create the look that I'm after. That's great insight. Thanks. Uh, Greg, just to uh, wrap up uh, our conversation about Dune, uh, I, I just have to ask you for, is there a, like a favorite sequence for you from a visual perspective to something when you watch the film you just kind of get giddy that just makes you happy that you know a particular challenge you had to solve or something that uh, makes you happy when it comes up i love the the lab i love that as a set the labs where duncan idaho's last stand is and i love the nexus which is where the sardaukar first um repel into and have the first fight with the fremen before that I love those two sets i love that that goes back to what i was talking about like the big to small it's a huge set 
to a really beautiful, small, intimate set. And um, I loved I loved shooting that because that big Nexus set was a real challenge. We had um, an amazing design where we had like a like a like a wagon wheel style series of shadows, and there was no way physically we could actually light that. There was not a light big enough to be able to create those shadows. And we all know that if we bring an 18K just above a flag, the, the, the cut isn't sharp. So we we built that outside between stages and we, we light studied it and we worked out that we had to shoot at a certain time and between 10 and 10.30 and stuff. And um, there was a very considered uh, approach. Um, but that then combined in with the lab where there's really important drama going on, but then also really important uh, action scenes. So I love that section. Many thanks to Greg and his team on Dune. Next up is Nightmare Alley. Here's director of photography, Dan Laustsen. So speaking of teamwork, uh, you know, you've had uh, several projects that you've made with Guillermo del Toro. Uh, he's such a visual filmmaker that you've collaborated with. How has that collaboration evolved for you? It is since we did Mimic from many years ago, I think even those days he was a master, you know, when I saw his first movie called Chrono, he did a small Mexican movie. And he's, I saw that, it was like, wow, this is amazing. And I think, you know, of course, he's getting better and better and better, but he's a super visual storyteller and, you know, in master in what he's doing. And from a cinematographer, from a cinematographer point of view, it's like a dream because you can just challenge your, it's all, all the time. And we're talking that we have the same feeling about even since Mimic, you know, there was a reason as we started working together. You know, we have the same feeling about lighting. We have the same feeling about darkness and the camera move and the moody things and the color palette, you know, these contrast colors. And if you see Mimic, that's like something we started. That look a little bit for like 25 years ago, whatever it was. Um, it works so well because we respect each other very, very much. I think he's fantastic. For, for me, he's like, He's just in the world. He, you know exactly where he wants to do. You can see the way he's telling the story with the camera, the way he's, everything is like, for him is like so precise and he's so into everything, you know, from production design, from costumes, makeup, cinematographer and camera movement. You know, he's just, he likes to have his hands on everything. And I think that's, it's great because he's not like, this is my way to do it. It's like, we are doing this together. And of course he's a director. So he's like, he has a final word, but, I think the way it works so well for us because, is because we, we have the same feeling about storytelling and the lighting and how it should end up in the end. And of course, there's a lot of ways to go there. And, you know, we, we talk about that a lot when we start to prep a movie. What were the original conversations that you had with Guillermo about this picture? Was it, uh, and did that happen when you guys were shooting Shape of Water or, or how far back did this start? First time I heard about this one, you know, we are talking about everything and, you know, then one day, and you know, what are we going to do next? Or what are you going to do next? Because, you know, uh, and then he said, um, I'm thinking about this movie called Nightmare Alley. It's based on a book and that's, there's been a Nightmare Alley shot in 47 and that's a black and white movie. So don't look at that. So I've never seen that movie. I just saw the trailer and it, you know, it looks nice, but I've never seen the movie. I'm going to do that one day, but I haven't never seen it. So that was like discussion. That was the beginning of that. And then, um, you know, Game was doing this kind of color palettes very, very early before I'm coming on, before I think everybody's coming on. He's doing this kind of concept drawings very roughly for the different scenes. So, you know, everybody has this idea about where he wants to go and everybody's coming in with these ideas and stuff like that. And he does have done that for the last couple of movies, actually since uh, Crimson Peak. And it's a really good way to start a movie because then everybody's starting on the same point. Instead of, you know, I'm coming in with my vision and the production design is coming in. And then we just have to blend into the directors. But when you have this visual director like Guillermo, you know, you're starting from scratch, but in the right direction. And I think that's, uh, that is uh, fantastic. So you shot for main camera on um, Nightmare Alley. You used the Alexa 65 and then secondary, I think, was the Alexa LF. Yeah, we shot with um, one camera all the time. You know, we shot, it's a one camera show. Uh, so the main, okay. the main when, when we start to prep the movie, when I was flying to Toronto and we talked about, 
we talked about maybe this movie should be an, an academy, the format academy, academy for for three. Um, I said, why not? You know, um, we have the same discussion every time about the format, but that's uh, so. On this one, he said, I want to let's try to, and uh, academy, and so I shot a couple of tests on that. And then I shot 185 American white screen, as we call it in in Europe. And then we shot some tests on the CinemaScope, um, and CinemaScope went away right away. And then for us, it just looks the movie looks too small on Academy, so we went to 185. And the reason I then talked about and shot some tests on the Alexa 65 because the way <clears throat> Guillermo was talking about the movie. I knew it was going to be a lot of moving camera, of course, and a lot of big close-ups. And the combination between Alexa 65 and whatever last format lenses we were testing, you know, that was going to be a really good combination. Um, so I shot a test with some uh, DNR and some 65 uh, Primo lenses, and then I shot a test with Signature Primes. And the Alexa 65 and the Signature Primes is, for my money, really, really nice. We shot Alexa XT and Master Primes on Silver Water. So we like this, like, what I like, I like lenses. They're not doing, giving me any surprises. You know, they're doing what I'm, you know, it's one to one. So if you want to have a lens flare you're going to make, it's not like, oh, by the way, we got a lens flare because the lenses are not performing correctly. So I like these super sharp lenses. They're doing really nice. And the close, close focus on signature prompts are really, really nice because I knew we was coming from like big wide, wide shop and then coming into like close, close. And so I need, I need some lenses that could, that could, that have close focus. But the 65 and the signature prompts are very, very sharp together. And it was like, it was not the, that way we want to go. So we did some tests with diffusion filter inside the camera. So, you know, inside. Yeah, because I don't want to have a, like a super, super high quality lens and put a, put a piece of glass in front of it. You know, the reason I like signature primes or whatever I like is like because the lenses are prefer, prefer, is doing the job very nice. But if you're putting a diffusion filter inside, you're keeping the black black because the black promise is not doing anything with the black when it's inside. Uh, and then the it's just diffusing the highlights and the skin zones very, very nicely. So we did a couple of tests on that. Um, so we shot with a quarter and an eight black promise inside the camera. And of course, that's a little bit tricky now and then because you have to take the lens off, you have to take the motors off. You know, if you want to change the filter in just before you're shooting, everybody hates you because like it's, it's a drag. Uh, but you have to be a little bit prepared there. But so um, we did that. And Doc Levender, Levender was, was first AC and, you know, he's fantastic too. It was not, not a problem at all, but it's just, I can really high recommend shooting with diffusion filter inside because it's not touching the black at all. So you have this, and you can see that in the movie, the black is really black, black. Even when we got flare, you've got a highlight into the lens, you know, it's not doing anything with, it. if you have a filter in front of the lens, you will just get a, a filter flare instead of a lens flare. Uh, and I like that very much, and get, Guillermo did that as well. So we, we, you know, we shot some tests and it was showed to him, and we decided to go that way. That that's really amazing, and I'm 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 so glad that you explained that because one of the things that Stuart and I wanted to ask you about was the way you use diffusion. the The film has such a, I mean, I hesitate to say because it it's a cliche, but almost like a dreamlike quality to it. It's it's sharp, but at the same time has that lovely that lovely ethereal nature. And it kind of, a, it, it made me think back uh, about uh, it, the Jeffrey Unsworth cinematography from the seventies that I just loved so much. So, and now you've explained how you did that, which is just amazing. When you have so many practicals as we have, for example, you know, in the carnival, you have, you have so many practicals. You're just going to have this double reflections all the time. If you have a filter in the front and you don't have that in the back. So, you know, Eric did, no, that was actually Sim video. Sim video did this for us. Um, and it works really, really nice. Um, and what I'm doing, I'm shooting this, the whole movie on the same C stop. I'm never changing that C stop. So I'm shooting between three, eight, two, eight, and four, the whole movie. So, you know, the, the, 
way the highlight is working is very consistent. And of course, you have to be careful with your exposures. You're not missing up the black. Uh, but you know, the, the filter inside is doing that. And of course, you have to do some tests if you want to do it. But uh, uh, it works really well for me, I think. It was, it was, and you know, Guillermo, as again, we did a lot of tests because we didn't want to have it too soft, but we wanted to, you know, the skin tone should not be like sharp, sharp, sharp. And of course, you're coming in to a super close up of Kate Blanchard, and they're like, you, with no filters, no filters on, it's just like, oh. And we didn't want to go into, you know, changing the filters, comparing to what axis we were shooting. We, we changed more of the filters, depends what set we was in. It was a little bit like you have to feel that, but you know, we, we, and a quarter and a, and a, a quarter and a eight is like, it's pretty subtle. Many of the shots, you were coming in lower than traditional and how that gave a different perception to the characters in the film. Um, was that something that was consciously done ahead of time? Yeah. We, when we start to prep the movie, we was talking about, you know, we was talking about some different kind of paint, paintings, you know, like Danis Hammershaw and Harper and stuff like that. But that was more like for the landscapes. And then we talked about, we wanted to shoot more wide angle as we have done before and much lower, you know, I, I will not say Citizen Kane, but we, can, we never talked about Citizen Kane, but you know, this like feeling you want to be low, you want to see, so we have ceilings in all the sets, you know, it's like super important for us to have low ceilings. So you saw the sets, you have the feeling about, for example, when Bradley's in the, or it, the, um, it's a hotel room. He's sitting with the fireplace. The fire's coming up behind him and he's turning around and he's coming up to that low angle silhouette shot where, you know, he's inside that box. You don't see his face, but you really feel his feelings. And I think we, we, that was what we tried to do a lot of times, you know, low angle, white, and just move the much, lo much longer takes comparing to Shape of Water, for example. Shape of Water was much more you know, design shots. And this was like much longer shots, of course, design as well. But you're just, the camera was floating more. And especially, for example, in case office, you know, we, there was a lot, a lot of long takes there. But we talked about that a lot together with Tamara, the production designer, about we want to be low, we want to see the ceilings, we want to have this feeling about people was inside a box. Uh, and especially in the Buffalo sequence, you know, but so the, the camera was always, always low. And even, you know, in the close-ups, we are coming down, we are coming into Kate and see the background beh behind her because it's, it's pretty wide angle lenses most of the time. Uh, and I think the last format is so well for that because when you're shooting last format, the, the depth of field is falling off very fast, even, even on a wide angle. If you shot with a smaller sensor, you will get much more depth of feel and that was not working for this show and I think that was the reason Alexa 65 was great for, great for me and for us and the LF was from the steady cam because the 65 is a heavy machine uh, so that was the plan we, we talked about that a lot you know talked about a lot see ceilings below moving in uh, and so the ceiling was a big deal uh, so all the light was coming from the sides um, because we have like fixed ceilings on, except except in the um, in hotel room, we have a little bit top light there for the dance, but otherwise it was coming from the sides. The movie uh, was recently re-released theatrically in black and white, which is, I, I think it's the first time I'm aware that a film has ever had an initial theatrical release, both in color and in black and white. Was that something that you and Guillermo talked about and thought about from the beginning? Was this a decision that was made late in the process? Or, and, and if so, how, how did you light this thing knowing that it was going to be in both formats? I didn't knew we were going to do it. We talked a lot about, you know, there could be options. So I was not, I was not sure about which way we was going, but we talked about that from number, from the beginning. Maybe this is going to be black and white, but we knew it was going to be a color release, of course. And then I think, I think the key is when you're doing a black and white version as well, you need to have, first of all, of course, you need to have a well-exposed negative or whatever days or whatever you call it, and we shouldn't keep it. Um, and the, the highlight have to be 
very defined. You know, you have to, the light have to have the direction, you know, and that was like, we have this clearly idea about in the carnival, the light should be a little bit more, you can say realistic, much more diffused, but single source lighting uh, from one side. Um, and then the black should fade out to, to black. So one direction, but you still have to have the exposure to, so you can play around with the black and white version later on. And then when we come into the Buffalo sequence, into the Coca Cabana and her office, we went much more into this like Art Nouveau lighting, you know, one single source light with a 1K in the long tube so we can could play around with the shadows in the front head and she can walk into a very precise lighting setup. And of course, that was a challenge for, for everybody, for the camera crew, for the lighting crew, for the actors, because you know, if she's taking one step further forward, then there's no shadows. If she's going too, too far away, she's coming, you know, she's out of the shadows. So, you know, for everybody, it was a very precise way to do this ballet because she was getting into a, because it, the shots were so long. So, you know, it was a ballet between the actors, the camera, the lighting. And it was fantastic, of course, but it was, and I think everybody loved that because for the actors as well, you know, it was like, you have to be here, not there. And of, there have been a lot of movies where the actors can just float around in the rooms and do whatever they like to do, and that's fine. But it was not what Guillermo wants to do. He wants to have this like Art Nouveau Hollywood lighting. And you see that on Kate when she's coming, she looks fantastic, I think. You know, I'm so, and that's, that's a challenge for everybody because it's like, if she's not hitting her mark or Bradley's not hitting the marks, you know, it's, it doesn't work. So like from, it's fantastic, so it doesn't work, it's like five centimeters or two inches or whatever it is. <laughs> and, wow. uh, and, and it's, um, so then my key grip, Robert, he's just, you know, a lot of flagging on the, on the, on the go, you know, everything was like, everything was floating around. It was, it was, as I said, a ballet, it was really good, a fun to do, but difficult because never, I have never done it before. For me, it was like, oh, but it, it, uh, yeah, in the end, it works pretty nice. Um, you've talked about uh, blacks and, and shadows and uh, and highlights. Um, so what are your thoughts on high dynamic range uh, and tools like Dolby Vision? I think it's great. You know, it looks, I love when black is black, you know, that's and a highlight is highlight. You know, I'm, I, I really like that. And I think that helps a lot, you know, when you, the, you can make the black pitch black. And I really like that. Uh, and of course, you know, the high the dynamic range for the, you're just getting more spectrum, you know. I'm not a technical guy, but if you, but I'm sitting there and doing a normal look and you're coming in and see the Dolby Vision, it's like, wow, this is pretty nice. So, you know, I, I think it's just help, help to perform better and, you know, the black is black and the highlight is brighter, you know. It's, it's, it, because a lot of times you have this, like, the black is gray and it's like, uh So I'm a big fan of it, you know. I think it's... I think it's uh, for me, it works really nice because I like black is black, uh, and Guillermo does the same. So you know, we we uh, it's it's getting much it's getting much powerful, and maybe it works in this movie because we have it can get a little bit too sharp now and then. You can say it's a little bit too contrasty, but on this one, because we have this slight diffusion inside it, uh, it's not like blowing the sharpness away, but it's just giving a more dam dynamic. Um, Look, I think so. I'm. Um, I love it. I, I'm curious about your relationship with the colorist and the DI part of the process and the mastering. Do you are how how involved are you with, with that part of the process? Um, and and uh, kind of what's your how do you see your role in the in that in that finishing of the of the film? I see my role like you know. I think everybody's you know. Guillermo and me and whoever that's working on the show is spending like months and months and years or whatever to figure out the right colors. So we don't, we don't want to change too much in the DI. Um, so the colorist for me is like another big, big help. You know, it's not like I'm coming into the DI and made a, want to make another movie. Of course, we did that when we did the black and white version. That was a totally other issue because we have to go in. Uh, and open the files and have to go into the raw files to go into the uh, 
Cyan and magenta and stuff like that. But that's another thing. But we, when you're talking about color, I think the DI is just working together with us. And I think he's just, or he's, he, he or she is just another very clever person that helping to make the movie look the way the director of photography and the directors think it should be. I'm not like, and for me, it's just, I need all the help on, on all departments. You know, I need the best grips and the best gaffers and my, the best camera crew and, you know, and the DI is a part of that. And, you know, set designers, makeup and hair, you know, everybody is making the movie. And I think the DI, the colorist is doing the same. You know, he's, he or she is just helping to finish, finish the look of the movie. And it's not like we're going in and okay, let's change it. Now have, everything has to be blue because if we want to have it blue, we were, we were going to do that from the beginning. I'm not saying, saying the colorist is not important because I think the colorist is super important, but that's the same. The gaffer is super important and the focus puller is super important and the set designer is super, and everybody's very, very important. And of course, when you're coming into the DI, it's getting very sensitive because you can do everything in the world. And I think it's important not to get lost there. But that's mm -hmm. what we do is like the dailies it looks very much like the end of the movie. We're not, you know, you're changing power windows and a little bit, you know, we're not, we're changing a little bit. Um, and this one was a little bit special because I was in Europe and, you know, we have so much COVID. So mm -hmm. the guys from company three were sitting in LA and I was sitting in Airy Media in Berlin and I was making a live action link. So it was fantastic. But it's just one thing you've been thousands of miles away. Um, so we did a lot of that work together. And then, of course, Guillermo came in now and then it just finesses it. Finesse it. Um, but from my point of view, everybody's working together on the move and everybody wants to make the same movie. And that's including the the DIP, the colorists. Uh, and it, it's just for me, you know, because... Again, we want to make, of course, you can have a scene and say, this doesn't work because it has to be another color. But I don't remember we have done that because we, we are so much up to color, color. You know, we're spending so much time to do it right on the set. So we don't want to. And that including everybody because you, the costume designers and the makeup and the production designers spending so much time together with Guillermo and myself to find the right colors. And you can change them in the DI. It takes you two minutes, then it's going to be, there's not more red or green or whatever. You, you just dial it. So we don't want to do that, you know. That's not the way we work. And, you know, we want to continue the work we did on the set. And, of course, you can crash the blacks a little bit or bring the highlights up a little bit. Better. And if I'm making too many mistakes, as I talked about earlier, <laughs> we can fix them. But, you know, normally, you know, because I'm getting frame grabs so I can see the dailies and I can see what we have in the DI and normally that's very, very close. Well, that's great. Dan, I really appreciate you. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Of course, it was a pleasure. A, such a remarkable film. And congratulations on your Academy Award nomination. Quite well deserved. Thank you very much. Too, too scary. <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks to Dan and his team on Nightmare Alley. Next up, The Power of the Dog. Here's my conversation with director of photography, Ari Wigner. Tell us a little bit about um, The Power of the Dog and how that project came to you. And do you remember your first meeting with Jane and what were those initial conversations like? Yeah, I kind of, I knew Jane um, via some mutual friends. Um, the Australian and New Zealand film world's quite, um, quite small. So everyone more or less has crossed paths with most people at some point. Um, and uh, probably about three or four years before Power of the Dog existed, um, uh, a mutual friend of Jane and I recommended that we would work together on a commercial that she was doing. Um, and it was kind of it's like a really small little project, only a couple of days really, but we, um, we just got on really well. We had a great time together and we both realised that we kind of share pretty similar taste and also that we were quite rigorous planners and were big kind of, you know, teacher's pets with our homework. <laughs> so um, then, um, yeah, we had a great time on that, but then we both kind of went our separate ways. Jane went and did um, some more Top of the Lake. Um, I went off and did a bunch of films. Um, and then 
yeah, kind of almost out of the blue, she called me and, and said, kind of, what are you what are you up to the next couple of years? <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, she, she mentioned that she um, had a book that she was adapting um, to a screenplay. Yeah, so I, I pretty much went out that afternoon and found it and read it twice pretty much back to back. It's such a, um, I mean, it was already a dream prospect, the idea of working with Jane um, and, and over a lengthy period and then and then this book is just, you know, it's really a dream for a, a DP to read. It's kind of rich with detail and it's incredible characters and beautiful location and just, um, yeah, very, uh, very blessed kind of series of events, I guess. I wanted to ask you about that. Was it, you said you went out and read the book right away and was it clear, like even starting just from the, from the book on the page, did you start to get images in your head of what this film might look like? I guess that's kind of what naturally happens when we read, we start kind of um, imagining some of the places that are described and the, yeah, it's really a scene, kind of a movie plays in your head for me anyway, when I'm, when I'm reading. So um but in, in many ways, it's actually kind of hard to re-access those old memories of my first impressions because they've kind of been <laughs> superseded. Um, I don't know if you guys find that when you when you've watched a, a film after having read the book, those old memories got they get kind of messed up. So it's hard to remember if any of those initial images kind of made it through. But what is incredible in the book that really resonated is. Um, these kind of intertwining characters, narratives, and they're really, um, you know, Jane describes it like a bit like the rope. They're really tightly intertwined um, and uh, and then this kind of gut-dropping moment at the end where someone who you've completely underestimated um, does something that you're just really in shock. You really almost don't believe it for quite a few pages. Um, it takes a while to actually understand that that's actually happened. Um, and that was something we were trying to you know, capture the spirit of, of that or, or try and have that experience as well for a viewer. You mentioned lengthy, um, which is a good segue. So my understanding is the uh, pre-production uh, was a year. How unusual is that? And what happened in that year of, of pre-production? Uh, very unusual. <laughs> um, but really the dream, I mean, so often you kind of arrive, or you, you hear about a project and there'll maybe be, um, you know, eight weeks or six weeks of, of pre-production, which for me feels like nothing. I mean, you always find a way to get it done, but um, by the time you've kind of seen all the locations, gone through the script with the director, done a tech scout, you're pretty much shooting the energy of that does kind of infuse into the into the work and there is kind of a energize it's not all doom and gloom there's like an energizing kind of uh i don't know rush that comes from from that and counting down the days till you you know day one um but there was something incredibly attractive about having you know a year to prepare um especially with something like this that it's very um it's a densely kind of woven narrative and it really requires like a kind of consideration and delicate touch. Um, so, uh, yeah, very unusual. But, I mean, it wasn't necessarily that Jane said, I need you um, to not do anything for the whole rest of the year. She, she wanted someone that was available kind of, I guess, in general to scout locations and start talking and, and be generally available. She didn't say you can't do anything else but, for me, once I, you know, once I read the book and then I read the script and I had a meeting with Jane, I mean, in many ways, the rest of the world is kind of just like fades off <laughs> as uninteresting and I couldn't think about anything else. It just became really, you know, um, I wouldn't even say I threw myself into the world. It kind of just like pulled me in and it was a good couple of years till I <laughs> kind of came out um, and yeah, all with great pleasure, really. I mean, it's just like kind of falling in love with the whole world. There's there's no detail that escapes you. I mean, I was reading about the history of fences and barbed wire and 
cattle breeding and everything that was just like fascinating to me. Uh, you mentioned location scouting. Uh, obviously, your you have a your setting is Montana in the 1920s, but you shot in New Zealand. So, what were the I guess the puzzles for you that you had to solve in kind of uh, making making that location work and and what was uh, what was exciting about kind of shooting in that New Zealand landscape? I actually think it's kind of an amazing bit of synchronicity or like gift from the world that Jane found this book or someone, um, I think actually her, her stepmother recommended it to her to read and this book kind of came to her and then the rights were became available and then it just so turns out that this part of the world that she knows so well is an incredible kind of geographic match for the place where this book is set and also that um, I guess Montana has changed a lot more since 1920s and in the South Island of New Zealand, um, which is for the most part, you know, vast parts of it that are very much, I imagine, as they were. Um, and that's really what was kind of super attractive to us, to, to be able to find a location where we could shoot 360 and kind of not be avoiding um, development or having to, you know, do ADR for the freeway that's just over there or anything. So um, we wanted to, to be able to create a real world that we could all kind of fall into and, and we found this kind of valley that was so perfect. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the amazing thing about filmmaking and the really satisfying thing is no one knows what's left and right of the frame or, or kind of what's what you don't show. <laughs> so um, it was just a, quite a lot of research to make sure that um, kind of our idea of Montana, like, would, would ring true to to people that had, um, you know, maybe lived there or, or kind of Americans in, in general, <laughs> probably a higher bar to meet than, than we did. But yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of creativity and a lot of interaction between yourself and, and, and the filmmaker. Um, can you talk a little bit about the color palette and how you went about choosing uh, the specific color ranges? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, over that year, we, we kind of color was one of the first things we dove into. I guess it's, it, some of those big decisions that they're going to be in every frame really. Um, and um, we definitely, we wanted uh, something that would kind of unify the whole story. Cause we, you know, as you said, we're in 2020 at the time shooting the 1920s or in Montana, or sorry, we're in New Zealand trying to shoot Montana or in studio trying to pretend that we're just, you know, in the wilds, we've, we've got the effects work. We've got a, a house that's probably still, you know, has the paint still drying and has to appear like it's been there for a, a really long time. Um, so we had this kind of conviction that a, a kind of reduced color palette would really focus everything kind of in. Um, and for us, it kind of started with, um, I guess, like what was always going to be in the frame for me actually color palette often starts with location because that is going to be what um you know when you're inside it's probably walls that's going to be behind someone and then when you're outside it's the location so you can't really start to think about color palette without looking at, at your location and the um we chose that particular part of New Zealand in that particular time of year knowing that the grass there goes this kind of incredible silvery um white almost um, after the summer um, dries it out incredibly dry. So um, that was always going to be part of it. It's kind of silvery gold, almost metallic. It's really incredibly sun bleached. Um, and then you, we had, we knew we'd have these kind of skin tones and the, the color of the animal pelts and kind of um, the cattle browns and blacks and there's kind of the timber of the barn and the leather of the saddles and the, um, and there's kind of like natural materials. I wanted to follow up on, uh, you know, we were talking about the lengthy prep and I, I think that one of the things that probably came out of that was the opportunity for you as the cinematographer to uh, interact with the production design. And I want to talk about that specifically mm -hmm. on the location of the house. <laughs> um, there's so much that I can talk about with the, with the house, but I, I, you know, typically I think in, in movies, you think about the home as like the safe space and the place to retreat mm. to. But 
but the house and the power of the dog is actually kind of the space of psychological violence. And it's a very unsafe space for yeah. Rose. So, and then on top of that, I know that, you know, the house was a, built on set in Auckland, far away from, you know, all the others. So can you talk about maybe the, yeah. the collaborative process between you and the production designer to build that location? Um, was there anything specifically that you brought to the table in terms of, of, you know, were, were the things that, that, that you kind of, you asked for that they built into the construction of the set that allowed you to shoot in, in specific ways. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm very curious about how you made that home so menacing. That was another one of the big first conversations, um, that Jane and Grant, um, major who's a production designer. And I had about this iconic kind of house and, um, Jane kind of described it like a like a boat in the ocean. Really, it has a kind of in many ways it doesn't even itself, it doesn't belong. There's like an uneasiness to it. The architecture and the kind of grandeur of it is, is in many ways like out of place in this um, kind of ranch. Um, and so we talked a lot a lot about the, you know, the shape of it and and how kind of um, I guess even like what style it would be and the colors in the landscape and, and then um I guess we kind of started building almost out from um the script has these a huge amount actually of these very specific eye lines um for example to see the where Phil's got the hides hanging we need to see from the kitchen or we need to see from the um uh from the barn to the house and we need to see from Phil's room down to um uh, Rose drinking in the alley and from the door to Rose playing piano and these kind of um, many, many, again, other jigsaw of how it's all going to fit together. So kind of the central space we started with was actually that um, core scene of Rose and Phil um, kind of dueling on the banjo and piano and that that almost that eye line was the first kind of building block, um, this central space. Um, and then it kind of built out from there um, and Grant just did such a beautiful job. I mean, it's really the work of an architect, that that house. It's um, every detail and, I mean, we really, like I said, talked about almost every detail from the the sheen of the floorboards and the, and the walls and, um, yeah, we, we really wanted it to feel that dark space. There's kind of a gothic element to it um, and in many ways I we saw this film as kind of like a monster film. It's like a monster in the house and and you're constantly aware of like where is he um, and is it safe to come out or it's it's just as scary to not know where he is than to know where he is. You know, it's kind of there's no safety. And then also part of that was he's kind of building this dark space that also would have a lot of kind of doors that feels vulnerable as well. There's kind of, um, and there's really that thing where Rose is, even no matter how much she tries to close all the doors, there's kind of always going to be one that, that he'll be able to get, get in. Um, and so, yeah, the, the darkness kind of inside and, and there's also like a kind of emptiness to it as well. Is um, We had the idea that the when the parents had left, they'd kind of taken quite a bit of the best bits of, furniture and and left kind of the the dregs almost and that there's kind of been no feminine kind of maternal um energy in the house for a long time it's kind of very practical in many ways kind of just uh like neglected kind of wealth um and so there's kind of a coldness in the design of it um and then the other big thing I think we talked about it was a big decision for us was the windows. Um, the I think in order for something to feel especially dark, it really helps when the outside is bright. So there's kind of a point of um, reference. And I mean, I was particularly nervous that somehow no one would ever believe that we were just on the ranch. <laughs> it was kind of actually the first 
big um, thing I'd ever shot on a stage. And, and you're right. So you have those huge windows right there that 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 are presumably are looking out on Montana. But but so how did you you know uh, yeah. obviously you designed with the production design you designed those big windows and but what was outside them and how did you control that mm-hmm. and then was that I mean was it basically just trans lights outside or how did you actually accomplish that? Yeah, we we discussed a lot of kind of options whether we would have you know. Uh, lace curtains or something which just felt way too feminine somehow like disguise it and blow out the windows or um did we do green screen and you know replace everything um uh but yeah we basically um (laughs) couldn't afford trans lights (laughs) um uh, we we basically a very basic kind of um almost like a billboard um you would see um we we um Jay Hawkins, who is our VFX supervisor, um, took um these kind of panoramic photos on location um when we were down in the South Island um of the of the, the hills and the the kind of I think we had three aspects um and we stitched them all together in a big big panorama and we kind of just basically got them printed on a very low technology um vinyl which we stretched over some um scaffolding basically and we would move them around to whatever um window required it so i mean it's amazing kind of optical illusion um and it's so cool that that i mean it's it's timeless it just works you but um you're almost in disbelief that it will work until you actually see it in camera and it's um it's really amazing how involved were you um with the um with the digital grading of the film and the final color correction and the um, I mean, I know the, uh, I think it, as Stuart was alluding, I know the, the, the film is streaming on, uh, on Netflix and Dolby vision. And was mm. that something that, that you were, were you involved in that particular mastering part of the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Trish Cahill was our colorist, um, in, in Melbourne and, um, yeah, she was, she was fantastic. Um, and we were, yeah, definitely in the Dolby vision kind of, um, world. I don't involve myself too much in the, um, <laughs> how it all gets to be other than that it looked um it looked great um in the suite and Jane was there for a lot of it as well we, I mean we just had a whole lot of fun kind of almost rediscovering the the images and um always kind of blows my mind what um how many memories as a DP you have like attached to a frame and you also remember all the things that all the like jobs that you hadn't finished that you literally said I would will fix that in the grade they really come back to you I, sometimes I'm nervous I won't remember but as soon as a frame comes up all this like the to-do list comes back up that you had on the day that you kind of um uh thought I'll put that in the back pocket and I'll, I'll finish this later literally so we can start shooting um so it was kind of a waves of, of memories of um, things that still needed to be done. So, yeah, it's, um, but no, it looked, um, we're incredibly excited by the, the Dolby Vision and what it even just looked like kind of on the, without, with very little intervention. Were there any specific sequences that you were able to kind of play and explore with in Dolby Vision in the, in, in the, in the color grade? I mean, just the, I think definitely those kind of high dynamic range situations like the, bright really bright windows um in the in the darkness um was something that was really like apparent to me like really what is in the sensor this there's actually like so much in there um and then also some of the there's some kind of incredibly there's this some scene the scene where phil is um in that willowy glade with the scarf um Actually, we kind of shot that with almost like a micro kind of crew. It was very much a closed set. So um, I was really, it was literally kind of just the, the light that was there. So that that was great to kind of do a little more reshaping and um, it's the kind of, those kind of like specular highlights that um, are sometimes quite hard to control, like the sheen of kind of, sweat on skin in really bright sun or the off the leather kind of saddle and chaps that actually is kind of almost like a mirror you don't think of leather being um like a mirror but really it's um when something's highly kind of polished it's like 
as reflective as, as a car almost, you know, so kind of that. Uh, we did a lot of work in those scenes, kind of just balancing the highlights for it to feel still kind of like a magical kind of glow, but also, um, you know, my pet, my pet um, hate is <laughs> peeve is the blown out highlights in digital. I can't, I just can't, um, uh, I can't. It's a, it's a cinema crime that I, I want to allow myself to commit. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, to, thanks so much, Ari, for talking to us today about The Power of the Dog and for joining us for this conversation. It's a really, really a pleasure and congratulations on your Academy Award nomination. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and pleasure to talk yeah. to you guys. Many thanks to Ari and her team on The Power of the Dog. As you may have figured out by now, we were unable to find time on Bruno Dalmanel's very busy schedule to discuss the tragedy of Macbeth, and same for Janusz Kaminski to talk about West Side Story. But make no mistake, each of these films showcase some truly incredible cinematography as well. I anticipate that this is going to be a very difficult category to predict this year. But thanks to all the nominees who joined us today, and best of luck to everyone who's nominated in the cinematography category. You can find links to all of the films we've discussed today in our show notes, and all of them are available for you to watch in Dolby Vision. But before you go, please make sure you're subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We have one more episode for our special Academy Awards coverage coming up this Thursday, and that episode is devoted to the best animated feature film category, and you will not want to miss it. You can find links to our dedicated podcast feed in our show notes, or you can just search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, thanks again for joining us. Sound and Image Lab is brought to you by the Dolby Institute. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for listening.